dear students welcome to our next lecture in the series indian polity by m lakshmikant now this lecture is a landmark lecture because we have reached 100 classes or i would say 100 lectures as a part of this particular series and it would almost go for another 50 uh, 50 lectures before we will complete this particular course the most comprehensive way that we are trying to deal with what is given in Indian polity. And I am very sure this particular series will be immensely helpful to the students preparing for the civil service examination 2024 and after. And if you are looking to learn in English language, I would say that you will get a comprehensive idea if you can watch this particular series. So, in the last lecture, we have completed the state legislature. So, today I am going to start the judiciary. And in the judiciary, I am going to start with the Supreme Court of India. So, as we will proceed, we will try to understand uh, the constitution of Supreme Court of India, the other constitutional provisions related to the Supreme Court of India, what is the issue with the appointment of judges in the Supreme Court, what the constitution says and what has been practically followed in our country today. So, we will try to understand all those things comprehensively in this particular lecture. All right. So, let us just proceed further. Let us try to understand as to the provisions of the Supreme Court as it is there in the Constitution. Now, if you see the genesis of the Supreme Court, after the commencement of the Constitution, the Supreme Court of India was established. But before the Supreme Court of India was established, the Government of India Act 1935 also provided for a federal court, a federal court of India. But then that was replaced after the independence, after the Constitution came into force by the Supreme Court of India. Now, the Supreme Court of India is the highest court in our country and we know that we have an independent and an integrated judiciary. So, what does it mean by an independent and an integrated judiciary? So, as the name suggests, what is independent? Now, independent means that the judiciary is free from the influence of the other organs of the state. They are free from the legislature and the executive. Largely, they are free and there is number of constitutional protection that is given under the Constitution. And then what does it mean by an integrated judiciary? If you talk of integrated judiciary, an integrated judiciary means we have just one single hierarchy of judiciary. So, at the apex, we have got what is called as a Supreme Court and then we have various high courts below that and then below that we have various subordinate courts. Okay? So, we will be studying all these things, but what is at the apex? The apex is the Supreme Court of India. That is exactly what we are going to study in the first few lectures and then we will move on to the other courts. Now, you see the Supreme Court which is there at the apex. The Supreme Court of India has replaced the federal court established by the government of India Act 1935. And in fact, the Supreme Court was more powerful than the federal court because the Supreme Court also abolished uh, the uh, various other mechanisms that existed. There is something which is called as uh, uh, Privy Council and that council was the highest authority to look, decide the cases which is given by the federal court. That means an appeal can be made against the order of the, uh, the federal court, but now the Supreme Court has become the highest court of appeal in our country after the Supreme Court was established. All right. So, we will try to understand about all those things as we will proceed further. So, today if you look into the constitution of India, what the constitution says? with regard to the establishment of the Supreme Court of India. So, Article 124 of the Constitution says that the Supreme Court of India shall be the highest court in our country and there shall be a seat of the Supreme Court in the National Capital Territory of Delhi. So, in Delhi there shall be the principal bench of the Supreme Court and that is what the Constitution says. And further if you look into the Constitution, the Constitution says that uh, the judges shall be appointed by the President of India. So, who shall appoint the judges of the Supreme Court? The President of India shall appoint the judges. And how many judges shall be appointed? That is the question. Today, there are 33 plus 1 judges in the Supreme Court. We have 33 judges plus 1 Chief Justice of India. So, overall, we have 34 judges. So, today, that is a sanctioned strength of the judges of the Supreme Court. But that was not the strength in the original constitution. In the original constitution, the strength that was authorized was 7 plus 1. There shall be 7 judges of the Supreme Court and then 1 Chief Justice of India. But however, the Constituent Assembly very well knew that this strength may not be sufficient 
in the future as and when the population increases. And that is the reason the constitution has given the power to the parliament. So, who can do that? The parliament has a power to vary the number of judges. So, the number of judges will be decided by whom? By the parliament. And what is the power of the parliament? The parliament can enact a law and in fact an ordinary law. So, they can enact a law and by that law they can determine the number of judges. So, in the future if the number of judges are to be increased, which was initially how much? Which was initially 7 plus 1 judges and if that number of judges is to be increased from 7 plus 1 judges, who has a power to do that? As I already said, the parliament has a power to do that. Accordingly, the parliament has enacted a law which is called as the Supreme Court Number of Judges Act. Initially, the strength was increased to 10 plus 1 and then by subsequent amendments, the strength has been increased continuously and today, what is the strength of the judges of the Supreme Court? As per the latest amendment to this particular act, it is 33 plus 1 judges. Now, the basic understanding you will have to take away from whatever I have said is that who has the power to regulate the number of judges, modify the number of judges in our country? It is the Supreme Court of India. The sorry, it is the Parliament of India. So, the Parliament can make a law and they can increase the number of judges. And today the number of judges is 33 plus 1. So, this is the basic idea you should have. But now the most important and the most crucial question that you have to answer is, how the judges in our country are appointed? Now, what does the constitution says with regard to the appointment of the judges of the Supreme Court? So, most of you might know that how the judges are appointed. The judges are to be appointed by the President of India when it comes to the judges of the Supreme Court. The President will make the appointment, but what is the internal process? before the president appoints the judges of the Supreme Court. That is exactly what we will have to understand. So, we will just proceed further. We will try to understand as to how the judges are appointed, alright. So, let us move forward. Let us try to understand as to what is given in the constitution and let us also try to understand how the judges are appointed. So, before I proceed further, you might be knowing that study IQ uh, has a batch and this batch is what is called as the prelims to interview batches which means this batch covers everything uh, from the prelim stage till the interview stage, which is the foundation program of study IQ. So, this prelims to interview batch is available in all the three languages. It is available in English, it is available in English, it is available in Hindi languages. It has number of features. So, it has features like uh, daily live classes, almost 1000 hours of live classes. Then it has got other features like the daily answer writing, it has current affairs program. It has got mains residential program. So, to, mo to know more about it, you can just download the brochure and you can study as to what is this mains residential program. And then after that, they also have an interview guidance program. So, it's, a, it's, it's trying to give a complete package to the students. So, students who are interested in these courses, uh, you can take admissions for these courses. The last day to take admissions for the month of August is 31st of August. And if you want to get an additional discount on these courses, not only to the P2I batches, but also to any course that is offered by Study IQ, be it their uh, uh, optional program, be it uh, uh, their long term program, be it their state PCS, you can use my code Babulai. All right. So now let us proceed further. Let us try to understand as to how the appointment of the judges of the Supreme Court is made. So the president has to make the appointment that we have understood. But what is given in the constitution? That the constitution says that the president before makes an appointment to the judge of a Supreme Court, he has to consult the judges of the Supreme Court and such other judges of the High Court and the Chief Justice of India. So, all these people has to be consulted. That means the president will appoint a judge of a Supreme Court, but before appointing, he has to consult the Chief Justice of India and such other judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court as he may deem necessary. That is exactly what is given in the constitution. That means the constitution does not say which judge of a Supreme Court and which judge of High Court shall be consulted, but it is saying as he may deem necessary. So, if the president thinks that he has to consult certain number of judges, he can consult those judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court, but consultation with Chief Justice of India is mandatory. So, he has to consult these people and then the appointment has to be made. That means basically when I say it is not a discretionary power of the president, so the president acts in accordance with the aid and advice of the council of ministers. So, in the original constitution, even today this is what is mentioned in the constitution, 
you can see that the appointment power is given to the president. So, the president is going to make the appointment. When we say that the appointment of the judges of the Supreme Court is to the president, who is having this particular power? This power is given to the executives under the constitution. So, the executives will make the appointment to the judiciary. And that is how the constitution is devised it. But today what we actually follow is that the executives are having the primacy in appointing the judges of the Supreme Court is what we have to understand. If you look into practically, today the system that we follow in our country is what is called as the collegium system. So, what exactly is the collegium system? And in fact, you will be surprised to know that this word collegium is nowhere mentioned in the constitution. So, collegium is nowhere mentioned in the constitution, but today we follow what is called as a collegium system. So, let us try to take a moment to understand as to what exactly is this collegium system. So, what does it mean by the collegium system? So, what is the collegium system? So, collegium system means it is a system of appointment where the judges to the higher judiciary are appointed by the judges. So, what does it mean by the collegium system? I am just repeating it again. That the judges to the higher judiciary are appointed by the judges themselves or it is a system of appointment where the judges appoint the judges. When I say the judges appoint the judges, that uh, does it mean that there is no role to the president in appointing the judges? So, that is not the case, but the role of the president has become very nominal in the entire process of appointment. Nominal means he does not have much say. Or in other words, today the president of India has to appoint those judges to the Supreme Court, those who are recommended by a collegium of judges in the Supreme Court. So, what does it mean by collegium of judges? Collegium of judges means group of judges. Those group of judges will recommend the name and those names or those persons shall be appointed as the judges of the Supreme Court. And that is basically what is called as a collegium system. That means or in other words I can say the power that has been given to the executives which means the president to act on the aid and advice of the council of ministers has been now taken by the judges itself by a collegium of judges rather by a group of judges. So, the group of judges in the Supreme Court will recommend the name to the judges, sorry, recommend the name to the president and the president is going to appoint those people as the judges. So, this is exactly what is called as the collegium system. Alright, now let us try to further understand on the one hand I said that the word collegium is nowhere mentioned in the constitution. So, what is the genesis of this collegium system? So, let us try to understand that and how the collegium system came into existence. Now, if you have to understand as to how the collegium system came into existence, it came through a series of judges cases, series of judges cases or I would say that the collegium system has evolved through three judges cases. So, even for the purpose of examination, you can main, mention that as judges case 1, judges case 2 and judges case 3. In every case, the Supreme Court came out with certain interpretations. And ultimately, in the third judge's case, it was finalized by the Supreme Court that how the judges shall be appointed to the Supreme Court. And that is the exact system that is followed in our country today. It is based on the judgment that is given by the Supreme Court in the judge's case. So, now let us try to understand as to how this collegium system evolved, where first of all the collegium system came into existence in which judge's cases. For which we will have to go back to uh, the first judge's case in 1981. We will have to understand as to what happened in this first judge's case. Now, this is the first time a question was brought in front of the judiciary to understand the meaning of the word consultation that is given in Article 124 of the Constitution. Because as per Article 124 of the Constitution, what does the Constitution say? Article 124 of the Constitution says, please understand that the judges of the Supreme Court shall be appointed in consultation with whom? In consultation with the Chief Justice of India and apart from that, he shall also consult such other judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court as he may deem necessary. So, consultation with the Chief Justice of India is mandatory and the other judges he can consult also. But then the question that was raised is, what is the meaning of this word consultation? Now, normally we understand what does it mean by consultation. So, consultation means you consult someone, but then the opinion that is given by them is not binding. You are just making a consultation and whatever opinion that they give may be not binding upon you or there is no need for you for you to follow those instruction or the opinion that they give. So, that is the normal understanding we have. 
So, this question was raised in front of the judiciary. The Supreme Court came and explained this. What is the meaning of the word consultation? This is exactly what the Supreme Court has to answer. So, the Supreme Court in the first judge's case said that the word consultation does not mean concurrence. Because in the petition, a question was raised whether the word consultation used in Article 124 is would mean only consultation or is it concurrence? There is a difference between the word consultation and concurrence. So, what is the difference between the word consultation and concurrence? If you see consultation, so consultation means you are just consulting someone and then their opinion is not binding. But concurrence means you are consulting someone and then the opinion that they give is binding upon you. Then that becomes concurrence. That means you will have to ask them and whatever opinion that they give, you have to follow it also. So, what is the meaning of the word consultation that is given in Article 124? It would only mean consultation or it would also amount to what is called as concurrence. The Supreme Court of India categorically said that the meaning of the word which is given in Article 24, when we say that the president has to consult, it is merely a consultation. It does not amount to what is called as concurrence. That means the opinion that is given by the Chief Justice of India is not binding upon the president. But what is important, what is mandatory, is that the president has to consult the Chief Justice of India. After consulting, the opinion may be given, but the president can function independently. Not necessarily he has to follow or he has to implement the opinion that is given by the Chief Justice of India because here the word consultation does not amount to what is called as concurrence. And who has been given primacy by this particular uh, decision? Who has been given a pivotal role or an important role in appointing the judges? The Supreme Court of India says that the primacy remains with the executive or in other words with the president. But when I say president, it is not a discretionary power. So, the president would continue to act on the aid and advice of the council of ministers and according to whose opinion the president shall appoint the judges, although he has to consult the chief judges of India before doing this. That is a decision that is given by the Supreme Court in the first judges case. Now, you know that the Supreme Court can look into its own decision. So, the matter was again brought to the Supreme Court through what is called as a second judges case. So, let us try to understand as to what happened in the second judges case. So, look into the scheme of events that happened in the second judges case. In fact, it is only the second judges case the collegium system award. Although in the first judges case, a clarification was given that what is the word consultation would mean. But when for the first time the word collegium was used by the Supreme Court, it was in the second judges case. So, in the second judges case, the Supreme Court made it very clear that primacy so, what is the question that was asked? So, so, let us try to understand the question that was asked in the second judge's case. So, in the second judge's case, a question was raised that, okay, the look into article 124, it is saying that, that the president before appointing the judges of the Supreme Court shall consult the chief judges of India and such other judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court. So, it is not only the president, but also the such other judges of the Supreme Court and High Court. So, who are the judges of Supreme Court and High Court need to be consulted? So, the Supreme Court for the first time said that the president has to consult a collegium of judges. And who are those collegium of judges? Who are those group of judges? Because this clarity is missing in the constitution. The Supreme Court categorically said that uh, this group of judges or the collegium of judges would include the chief justice of India plus two senior most judges of the Supreme Court. So, below the chief justice of India, there will be other two judges. So, the Chief Justice of India plus the two senior most judges has to be consulted. And then the second important change, so this is the first time that the collegium system came into existence. Now, apart from the collegium system, what is the other change also brought in by the Supreme Court in the second judges case? Another question was also raised in this particular case that, okay, collegium means that it is Chief Justice of India plus two senior most judges, they have to be consulted. But what is the meaning of the word consultation? The Supreme Court said that the word consultation would amount to concurrence. They have changed their earlier decision. And they said what? Consultation would amount to what is called as concurrence. So, how is this judgment different from that of the previous judgment? While in the previous case, that is in the first judge's case, the Supreme Court categorically said that the president has to consult, but that opinion is not binding. But in this case, the Supreme Court of India is saying that the president has to consult not only the Chief Justice, but the president has to consult a collegium of judges, which includes chief justices of India plus two senior most judges. And the opinion that they give is binding upon the president because consultation is not merely a consultation, 
but it would amount to what is called as concurrence. Now, when this judgment was given, there is another confusion in this particular case that okay that now the decision which is given by the Chief Justice of India and two senior most judges is binding. It is, con it is also amount to what is called as concurrence. But now the question is what if different judges give different opinion? The Chief Justice of India is suggesting one name, the other judges are suggesting some other names. Which opinion is binding upon the President? Now, for which the Supreme Court of India clarified that the primacy would be given to whom? The primacy would be given to the Chief Justice of India. If there are differing opinions, whose opinion is binding? Although you will have to consult the Collegium of Judges, the opinion which is given by the Chief Justice of India is binding upon the President and thereby a primacy has been given to the Chief Justice of India. While in the first judge's case, the position of the President or the primacy was given to the executives, whereas in the second judge's case, the primacy was shifted to the judiciary and the role of the President has become nominal. And within the judiciary, whose position has become very pivotal or the most important thing is the position of the Chief Justice of India because his decision will have the primacy. But this decision was also not final and then subsequently in the year 1998, the third judges came, cases came, the same matter was again brought before the Supreme Court. So try to understand the series of events. First judges case, the primacy was with the executives because consultation would amount to what is called as consultation and not concurrence. Second judges case, here the president has to consult a collegium of judges, chief justice of India plus two senior most judges. But however, whose opinion would be binding? It is only the opinion that is given by the Chief Justice of India and they said consultation would amount to concurrence. Now, what is the further change that has happened in the third judge's case? The third judge's case 1998 was brought to the notice of the Supreme Court through a presidential reference. A presidential reference was made under Article 143. Under Article 143 of the Constitution, the President can refer certain matters to the Supreme Court on a matter of urgent public importance. or a matter related to the interpretation of the constitution. So here there was an interpretation that is required related to article 124. Now what was the major question that was raised in this particular case is that first again they wanted to understand as to who are the group of judges and how do you come out a conclusion that it is chief justice of India plus two senior most judges. That is not mentioned in the constitution so we wanted to understand as to what is this collegium and who will be part of the collegium. And then the second important thing is nowhere in the constitution it is mentioned that the primacy should be given to the Chief Justice of India. But in the second judge's case, you have said that the primacy should be given to the Chief Justice of India. So that means uh, this is beyond the scope of the constitution. So these clarity was sought in the third judge's case. So the matter has gone to the Supreme Court in the third judge's case. The Supreme Court interpreted Article 124 and said that the very intention behind the Constituent Assembly as to why they have given this particular provision that the President shall consult the Chief Justice of India and such other judges of the Supreme Court and High Court, the very idea is that the President has to consult a collegium of judges and hence we will expand the collegium. So they have expanded the collegium which was already innovated in the second judges case and now they said that the collegium would mean Chief Justice of India plus four senior most judges. So today what is the collegium? So today the collegium is as per the third judges case it is Chief Justice of India plus four senior most judges. And this is uh, the position we follow even today. So the president has to consult the chief justice of India plus next four senior judges in the Supreme Court and they will suggest the name in appointing the judges of the Supreme Court and which is binding upon the president. Now the question is what if there is a differing opinion because earlier in the second judges case the primacy was given to the chief justice of India. Now it is argued that it is beyond the scope of the constitution giving an authority to one single person. So this was again analyzed by the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in this particular case, rightly so, they have said that here the primacy will not be to the Chief Justice of India because the idea in the constitution is that the power should be given to the plurality of judges, not just only to the Chief Justice of India. And hence what the Supreme Court said in this particular case, the Supreme Court said that out of the Chief Justice of India plus four senior most judges, even if two senior judges, so including the Chief Justice of India, there are five judges, right? So out of those five judges, even if two senior judges have a differing opinion than that of the other judges, 
if he has a differing opinion, then such an opinion shall not be forwarded to the president. And hence, please understand what is the basic requirement today out of the Chief Justice of India plus four senior most judges, at least Chief Justice of India and three senior most judges has to be on the same page. They should concur on a particular name. And then only such a name can be forwarded by the Chief Justice of India to the president. And then only such a recommendation which is made by the collegium is binding upon the president. So, in the second judge's case, the primacy which was given to the Chief Justice of India has been now shifted to the collegium. That is one change that has happened. What is the second change that has happened? Not only the primacy has been shifted to collegium and the collegium has also been expanded in the second judge's case. Sorry, in the third judge's case. So, relatively, now you can see that now the collegium is expanded and the power rests in the hands of the entire collegium and not just in the hands of the Chief Justice of India. So, once the collegium forwards the name, then the president will appoint those people. And in between these two process, after the collegium recommends the name and before the appointment, the government can do a background verification of these names. The government can use its law enforcement agencies, it can use its intelligence agencies to do a background verification and a character verification of the names of those judges which has been recommended. And once it is approved by the government, then they can make the appointment. Today, there is no time limit within which the government has to make this appointment. So, there is a little bit of vacuum and a tension that exists between the judiciary and the government because sometimes the government delays the appointment and this has been criticized by the judiciary. But however, there is no uh, time limit under the constitution as to when the judges have to be appointed after the recommendation is. Alright, so this is basically what you will have to understand. But today you know that a lot of uh, uh, discussions happened few months back that the government was trying to introduce a bill to bring in what is called as a National Judicial Appointments Commission that this present collegium system would be replaced by what is called as a commission. Now, who are part of the collegium system today? Today, only the judges are part of the collegium system. And the judges recommend the names of the judges to be appointed in the Supreme Court. So, the very idea behind this collegium system is, what is the reason that the Supreme Court has given earlier, is the judges are in the best position to assess the qualities and caliber of those people who are to be appointed as the judges. And hence, they should be the one who will decide the names and recommend that to the president. But then it has a lot of criticism also. What is the criticism of this collegium system? They said that the collegium system is non-transparent. It is also criticized that uh, it promotes a lot of nepotism and it is completely a closed door affair. So, because of all these criticism, in 2015 itself the government amended the constitution, rather the parliament amended the constitution. And by way of the 99th Constitutional Amendment Act, they brought in a new mechanism for appointment which is called as the NJAC, National Judicial Appointments Commission. So, what is NJAC? I am just repeating it again, make attention to this, National Judicial Appointments Commission. But this National Judicial Appointments Commission was challenged in the Supreme Court and that was struck down by the Supreme Court in the year 2015. So, the 99th Constitutional Amendment Act which brought in this NJAC, National Judicial Appointments Commission, is no longer in practice. It has already been struck down by the Supreme Court. And we know that a constitutional amendment can be challenged on only one ground. What is the ground? Think about that. We already discussed that. A constitutional amendment can be challenged in a court of law on only one ground. That is on the ground of violation of the basic structure. So, basic structure is the only ground on which it can be challenged. So, in this case, they said that the NJAC is violative of the independence of the judiciary. And the independence of judiciary was declared to be part of the basic structure. And then they subsequently declared this NJAC to be null and void. Now, how does this NJAC is violative of the basic structure? Because if you look into the National Judicial Appointments Commission, the composition of NJAC, it will have representatives from executives, it will have representatives from the general public. So, it will have representatives from public and it will have representation from the judiciary as well. And most importantly, the members of the general public who are to be nominated by the president of India, they have got veto powers. So, they can veto the decision that is given by the judges. And hence, uh, this was found to be uh, a provision intervening with the independence of the judiciary. And the Supreme Court declared independence to be the basic structure of the constitution and to that extent, 
this NJAC was struck down and declared to be void. But however, this chapter has already been closed by the Supreme Court. The government was trying to bring in a National Judicial Appointments Commission. Lot of debates were happening, but nothing has come forward very solid in ground till this point of time. But students were preparing for the coming year examination. Maybe you have to watch out on any further developments on the lines of an appointments commission. All right. So now we'll just proceed further. We'll move to the next topic. So today, how the judges are appointed? The judges are appointed based on the collegium system. And what constitutes a collegium? It is a chief justice of India plus four senior most judges. Today, the primacy rests not on the chief justice, but on the collegium. Let us try to understand further constitutional provisions and some of the qualifications required for someone to be appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court. All right. Have a look into this. So, for someone to be appointed as a judge of a Supreme Court, he or she should be a citizen of India. That is very, very important. To be a judge in the Supreme Court, he should be first a citizen of India. In addition to that, so this is mandatory. In addition to that, one should be a judge of any high court for five years or a practicing advocate of any high court or more than one high court, high court in succession for 10 years. That means they are a practicing advocate in any high court and they have practiced for more than 10 years without any break or they are a judge in any high court for five years. Then also, in addition to that being a citizen of India, then they can be appointed as a, Supreme, a judge of a Supreme Court. That is just a qualification I am saying. Not necessarily everyone with a qualification will be appointed as a judge. But these qualifications are mandatory for someone to be appointed as a judge. In addition to that, one should be a distinguished jurist. What does it mean by a distinguished jurist? That in the opinion of the President of India, somebody who has got a good knowledge in legal jurisprudence. So, one one who has been practicing for a long time or someone who has got a good knowledge in law. Okay. So, people either this or this, but this is a mandatory condition. In addition to first condition, you will have to possess any one of these conditions to be appointed as a judge of a Supreme Court. Provided today the, such people names are recommended by the college, then the president can make the appointment. And anybody who is appointed as a judge of a Supreme Court, they have to be administered oath by the president of India. So, they have to be administered an oath. And without this oath, they cannot assume the office. So, it is very, very important that this oath is administered. And then they will also be eligible to get the salaries and allowances as may be determined by an act of parliament. So, who is going to determine the salary? It is the parliament. And once appointed as a judge, they can hold on to that particular office till the time they attain 65 years of age. That is very important. What is very important is till they attain 65 years of age, not till they complete 65 years of age. And it is also noteworthy that while the constitution says that the maximum age till which they can hold on to the office, the constitution does not prescribe the minimum age limit for someone to be appointed as a judge. Very, very important. Is there any minimum age limit under the constitution? There is no minimum age limit for someone to be appointed as the president, of, uh, appointed as the judge of a Supreme Court. And on top of that, they can resign at any time by addressing their resignation to the president of India. So, they can write their resignation letters, give it to the president and they can resign for any reasons that they can state in their resignation letter. And apart from that, they can also be removed by the president on the recommendation of the parliament. So, that means if a question comes, who is the authority to remove the judges of the Supreme Court? It is not that the parliament, it is a president who is the removal authority. But the president can do so only on the base of a recommendation which is given by the parliament. So, what is the recommendation? What is the procedure that is laid down in the constitution? Or what is the ground that is laid down in the constitution on which the parliament can make this recommendation is what we are going to understand. So, come to the next topic as to the removal of the judges of the Supreme Court. In fact, uh, this is provided under Article 124 of the Constitution. Let us try to understand as to what is the removal process, the removal of the judges of Supreme Court. The president is removed, so he or she is removed by an order of president on the recommendation of the parliament. So, if you look into the Constitution of India, the Constitution of India says that the judges of the Supreme Court can be removed by the President on the recommendation of the President. When I say recommendation of the President, uh, sorry, recommendation of the Parliament, the recommendation of the Parliament means a motion has to be introduced in the Parliament. 
a motion has to be introduced in the parliament and that motion has to state the reason as to why the judge is to be removed. So, what are the grounds that is mentioned in the constitution as to the grounds on which the judges can be removed? There are two grounds that is mentioned in the constitution. One is misbehavior. So, one of the ground is misbehavior or on the grounds of incapacity. Although the constitution does not define as to what is misbehavior or incapacity, but the grounds are mentioned. I am repeating it again. The constitution does not define as to what is misbehavior or incapacity. But what the constitution says that they can be removed on the grounds of misbehavior or incapacity. So, any member who wanted to remove the judges, any member of parliament, they, they can introduce a proposal in the houses on the grounds that the judges have involved in what is called as misbehavior or incapacity. Now, once that is introduced, then there are certain procedures that has to be followed. And the constitution does not elaborately define those procedures also. Rather, the constitution only says that the judges of the Supreme Court shall be removed by an order of president on the recommendation of the parliament. But what are the procedures that needs to be followed? Who will determine whether the judges have engaged in misbehavior or incapacity? Everything is defined and it is regulated under the law that can be made by the parliament. So, the parliament is given the power under the constitution to determine all those things. Accordingly, the parliament has enacted what is called as the Judges Enquiry Act. So, if at all a proposal is introduced, so how this proposal will be dealt, how this motion will be dealt in the parliament is laid down in the Judges Enquiry Act. So, now let us try to understand as to what is laid down in the Judges Enquiry Act. So, try to understand that the constitution only says that the president shall remove the judges of the Supreme Court on the recommendation of the parliament. And in the parliament, the motion can be passed on the grounds of misbehavior or incapacity against the judges. But what is this misbehavior or incapacity is not defined. How these motions shall be passed, what is the procedure to be followed in the, uh, in the parliament is not defined in the constitution, not prescribed in the constitution. So, how all these things shall be followed in accordance with the law that can be made by the parliament. This power is given to the parliament in the constitution. So, accordingly, the parliament has enacted the Judges Enquiry Act. And the Judges Enquiry Act provides for the following mechanisms, the procedures based on which a judge of a Supreme Court can be removed. So, what is the procedure that is laid on? So, first of all, the motion can be introduced. So, who can introduce? A member of parliament can introduce this particular motion on the grounds of what? On the grounds of misbehavior or incapacity. So, where he can introduce? He can introduce in the either houses of the parliament. That means a member of parliament can introduce this particular motion on the grounds of misbehavior or incapacity and he can do that in either houses of the parliament that is in the Lok Sabha or in the Rajya Sabha. In whichever house he wanted to introduce, the law says that is the judges inquiry access that it has to be supported by minimum of 50 members or 100 members respectively in the Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha. Suppose if you want to introduce that in the Rajya Sabha, it has to be supported by any, another 50 members. Suppose if it is introduced in the Lok Sabha, it has to be supported by another 100 members. Suppose let us assume I am a member of parliament, wanted to introduce a motion to remove the judge. It has to be supported by another 100 members in the Lok Sabha. Then only I can introduce that particular motion in the Lok Sabha with the permission of the presiding officer. But however, please understand, it is not mandatory even if it is supported by 100 members that the presiding officer should give the permission to introduce this because it is a discretionary power of the presiding officer. That is what the judges inquiry access. So, normally they give the permission, but it is a discretionary power. Once the presiding officer gives the permission, then the motion will be introduced in the respective house, provided it is supported by the minimum members. It will be introduced and in whichever house it is introduced, then it is a responsibility of the presiding officer to appoint an investigative committee and this investigative committee will comprise of three members. It will consist of a retired judge of a Supreme Court, usually a retired judge of Supreme Court, of a Supreme Court, plus a retired Chief Justice of a High Court, plus it will have a distinguished jurist. So, these are the three member committee that will be there, distinguished jurist. So, three member committee has to be appointed by the presiding officer of that particular house. Now, what is the role of this uh, three member committee? So, the three member committee will inquire on the charges which is introduced in the house. 
and then they will see whether the judges have engaged in what is called as misbehavior or incapacity. So, misbehavior means that uh, they engage in acts like sexual harassment or corrupt activities or uh, behavior unbecoming of a judge. And then incapacity means a judge suffering from mental incapacity or physical incapacity that prevents a judge from performing his duty effectively. So, it is the role of this particular committee to determine whether the charge is true, whether there is a charge which is satisfying misbehavior or incapacity. If the report of the committee is affirmative, that means if the committee is convinced, yes, the judges have engaged in what is called as misbehavior, then they will place the report in the house. Now, once uh, the committee submits the report, then the house will take up that particular motion and there will be debate in the house and the debate will be put to vote in the house. And when it is put to vote in the house, if it is passed with special majority in the house, what is the majority? Special majority. So, here the special majority means it has to satisfy two conditions. Not less than two thirds of the members present in voting and that should also satisfy the absolute majority of the house. When both the things are satisfied, not less than two thirds of the members present in voting and the absolute majority, when it is passed in the first house, then the proposal will be passed on to the next house. When the proposal is taken up for debate in the first house, the judges have the right to defend themselves also. They can defend themselves on their own or by way of a counsel. And then when it is passed on to the next house, in the next house also when it is passed with special majority, then it, the proposal will go to the president. And then the moment the president approves it, then that means the judges stands removed. Then the judges cannot do anything about it. And this is a process by which the president of India can remove a judge of a Supreme Court. So, this is basically what you will have to understand. But however, please understand, not even a single judge of a Supreme Court has been removed in our, con in our country till this point of time. Although in 1989, a motion was introduced against Justice Ramaswamy, who was then judge of the Supreme Court. So, against him, a motion was introduced and the three-member committee was also convinced that he has engaged in what is called as uh, misbehavior. But however, it was not approved in the Lok Sabha. It was not passed with a special majority in the Lok Sabha. So, an extremely difficult process to remove the judges of the Supreme Court. Okay, so this is basically the understanding you should have. So, the idea is that uh, the judges may be removed at the same time they should have a lot of independence and that is why removal of the judges of the Supreme Court is extremely difficult under the constitution. Apart from that, let us also try to understand the acting ad hoc and the retired judges of the Supreme Court. So, under certain circumstances, the president can also appoint certain acting judges. So, the president can appointing the acting chief justice of the uh, Supreme Court when the chief justice of India is absent or the post is vacant or although he is, there is a chief justice of India, but the chief justice is unable to perform his duties because he is admitted in the hospital or any of the other reason. Under such a circumstances for a temporary time, any judge of the Supreme Court may be appointed as the chief justice of India. This is a temporary appointment and then subsequently under the constitution of India, the chief justice of India, remember the chief justice of India can appoint the ad hoc judges to the Supreme Court. So, ad hoc judges means a temporary appointment to the Supreme Court. The high court judges may be appointed as ad hoc judges and who can do that? The chief justice of India can do that. Now, why the chief justice of India is doing this? Because in the Supreme Court, there is something which is called as lack of quorum. So, what does it mean by lack of quorum? So, lack of quorum means that the number of judges in the Supreme Court is less to carry out its functions. And because it is less, it is affecting the administration of justice. Under this particular circumstances, the Chief Justice of India can appoint ad hoc judges and who may be appointed? Any judge of a high court, any judge of high court, but who has got the qualification to be appointed as a Supreme Court. We already seen as to what is a qualification. So, any judge of high court who has got the qualification to be appointed as a judge of a Supreme Court may be appointed as a judge of a Supreme Court on an ad hoc basis with the consultation of the Chief Justice of the concerned High Court and the prior consent of the President. So, the Chief Justice of India cannot do it on his own. And before doing that, he has to consult the Chief Justice of the concerned High Court because he is going to uh, take a judge from there and appoint them in the Supreme Court. And hence, it should not affect the functioning of the High Court. So, the Chief Justice of the concerned High Court is to be consulted. And along with that, who shall also be consulted? Along with that, 
it is also necessary that he takes a consent from the president. His prior consent is also important. And then the next thing is the Chief Justice of India can also request a retired judge of a Supreme Court or a High Court also to perform the duties of the, high, uh, of the Supreme Court to act as a judge of High Court temporarily. But in this case, there is no need that there is a lack of quorum or something. So, whenever he feels that there is a need, he can request any retired judge of the Supreme Court or that of High Court to act as the judges of the Supreme Court for some time. But in this case also, he has to take the prior consent of the president and he has to request the consent person. So, the consent person is willing to take up this responsibility and with the prior consent of the president, he can do this. Who? The Chief Justice of India. But before doing this, please understand, if he is going to appoint a retired judge of High Court, he has to see whether the retired judge of High Court is having the qualifications to be appointed as a judge of a Supreme Court. So, these are the circumstances which is provided in the constitution itself to meet any form of uh, uh, exigencies because you never know when the vacancies will arise, when it can affect the administration of justice. Okay? So, these are all the provisions. These may be asked in the prelims examination. Alright, so with that, just come to the question. So, this is time to test your knowledge. So, consider the following statements. Statement 1, the motion to impeach a judge of a Supreme Court of India cannot be rejected by the Speaker of the Lok Sabha as per the judges inquiry act. So, can the Speaker reject? Is it the discretionary power or he has to compulsorily allow for it? Statement 2, the Constitution of India defines and gives details of what constitutes incapacity and provides misbehavior of the judges of the Supreme Court of India. Does the Constitution defines it? So, here is it the discretionary power or is it his, uh, is it mandatory for him to give the permission or normally what the presiding officer does, ok. So, this is something that you have to know here. Third thing, the details of process of impeachment of the Judges Inquiry Act of the Supreme Court is given in the Judges Inquiry Act 1968. That is, a procedure is laid down in the Constitution or in the Judges Inquiry Act. Statement 4, if the motion for impeachment of the judges is taken up for voting, the law requires the motion to be backed by each house of the parliament and supported by a majority of total membership of that house and by not less than two-third of the total members of that house present in voting. Which of the statements given above is or correct? So, try to answer this particular question, okay. So, that is what is important, okay. So, try to answer that question, try to put your answers in the comment box and if you like this particular uh, session, you can also recommend this to your friends. And if you want the PPT of this uh, particular uh, presentation, you can get it from my Telegram channel. And also don't miss out on the important current affairs question that I put on daily basis in the Telegram channel. Thank you very much. All the very best. God bless.